Good morning. I'm Representative Tom Burden, and I'll be chairing the House Judiciary for a, a little while this morning. And we're going to be taking a look at H317, an act relating to establishing the Bureau of Racial Justice St Statistics and the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics Advisory Panel. And we have a number of uh, um, witnesses today, but what we're going to do is start out with an overview of the bill from um, Representative Lalonde. All right, thank you, uh, Vice Chair. Um, so yeah, I just thought we'd put this uh, bill in context of uh, uh, what we're looking at today. Uh, it, it's kind of um, the latest uh, bit of this long path uh, that we've been traveling for the last few years related to uh, data in the criminal justice system. Uh, I think we've uh, really realized over the past uh, six years that to help guide our policy making to understand what we should do, understand what's working and not, uh, we need better uh, criminal justice uh, data. Uh, and also this really came to light even more so in the work of the Justice Reinvestment uh, II uh, initiative, uh, where we had the assistance of the CSG, uh, the, uh, I'm gonna forget what CSG stands for, uh, Eric. Council of State Governments. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Coach. Uh, any event, so we, we uh, with the help of the Council of State Governments, uh, this uh, initiative, the uh, Justice Reinvestment was done, really looking at uh, sentencing, looking at our criminal justice system, and what they found was some real data issues that we had. So uh, as part of the, the bill that implemented uh, recommendations from that uh, work, uh, there was a group set, uh, there was a group, working group set up to look at criminal justice data. It was under section 19 of that particular bill and it was uh, headed up by the racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice system advisory panel, better known as RDAP. Uh, RDAP had done some previous work on data. Uh, they were created uh, back, I believe in uh, 2019, and they uh, issued a report in December of 2019 uh, that in, in, um, covered a lot of issues, but one of the issues that it, it did address was the need for better data, uh, not just in the criminal justice system, but across the state for looking at racial disparity. Uh, they head up, headed up the, issue, the uh, initiative under the Justice Reinvestment uh, to uh, they headed up the initiative as far as looking at further at the criminal justice data needs for looking at racial disparities and issued a report uh, in December of last year, uh, making a recommendation, listing out uh, data elements that are important for us to look at to uncover where disparities are arising in the criminal justice system, and also uh, recommending the creation of a Bureau of Justice Statistics which led uh, to the bill uh, H317, uh, which laid out uh, the various data elements that we should be collecting uh, and laid out uh, a roadmap for a Bureau of Justice Statistics. Um, so we looked into, you know, we've been looking at how best to, to set up the Bureau and really where we've ended up is we need some more time, we need some expertise, we need RDAP uh, and some other individuals, other organizations to help us figure out how to implement this. So this is a bill that we're gonna be looking at this morning that implement, or it's the next step really, it, and it's to come back with a, a game plan for how we're actually gonna implement uh, the Bureau of Justice Statistics. So I'll stop there, but I, I, I would assume that uh, Representative Christie might want to weigh in as well before we get started with the uh, uh, walkthrough uh, with uh, Eric. I don't know if that's true, uh, Representative Christie or not, but I... Coach, did you want to uh, say a few words before we do the walkthrough? Uh, Mr. Chair uh, and fellow committee members and guests and witnesses, um, this is an exciting time. Uh, as we know, any time that we embark upon new paths and new territory, it, it, uh, it isn't as smooth sometimes as we would expect uh, on the front end. 
but I really appreciate the work of RDAP uh, and its members and the partners that have come on board as well. And this is truly an instance of partnership. So I am just adding that uh, I'm grateful and it's a proud moment for Vermont. Thank you. Thank you, coach. And next we will hear from um, our legislative council, Eric Fitzpatrick, who will do a walk through the bill. Thank you and uh, good morning, everybody. This is Eric Fitzpatrick uh, with the Office of Legislative Council for the record, here to talk with the committee about uh, a new proposed amendment to H317, which as I'm sure the committee remembers is the legislation dealing with uh, establishing the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics as Representative Villan just described in more detail. Uh, the, the new amendment, the gist of it, the proposal I should say, I, you probably will recall that as the committee has been talking about the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics uh, during the session, one of the main uh, focuses of conversation and, and discussion, not only among the committee, but among the, uh, the interested parties and the people with expertise in this area, has been where, where to situate the Bureau. Where, where in state government or where outside of state government? Should it be a standalone entity? Should it be uh, a quasi-governmental entity? That's been a, a great uh, point of discussion. And I think there've been a lot of different points of view on that. but. Uh, uh, the prior versions of the, both the bill as introduced and the previous version of the amendment, you may recall, the bill as introduced situated the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics in, within the agency of administration. So it was within the AOA alongside uh, the, the Office of Racial Equity. So it wasn't, it wasn't under the Office of Racial Equity, but it was alongside it uh, in, in the agency of administration. That uh, was, as I say, the bill has introduced. The next uh, proposal that you saw in, in the last version of amendment uh, had the Bureau of Racial Equity within and supervised by RDEF. As Representative Lalonde said, that's the Racial Disparities in Criminal and Juvenile Justice Advisory Panel, and that is a mouthful, so we say RDAP to shorten the length of my testimony considerably. <laughs> so the uh, uh, that was the, the next proposal, that the Bureau would be within RDAP and, and uh, supervised by RDAP. Uh, and now this proposal, as I say, then so that this discussion continued about what, what made the most sense and their positives and negatives about where, where to situate the Bureau. Uh, and I, it turns out, or what seems to have been the case, is that there is not yet consensus on that point. So there, there needs to be further discussion. Uh, analysis of the, uh, the advantages and disadvantages of placing the Bureau in different possible homes. And uh, so that's what this amendment does. Essentially, it, it uh, pro, uh, uh, perpetuates this discussion, allows it to continue uh, for a bit longer during the interim so that RDAP will be required to submit a report uh, in November that will specifically recommend you know, where where this uh, bureau ought to be situated, or at least analyze the positives and negatives of situating it in different places. So that it essentially, as I say, permits that discussion to continue um, and hopefully reach consensus, so, which hasn't, hasn't been attained yet. There have been obviously many different possible points of view on this with their own uh, ups and downs. Um, so this uh, essentially establishes a study that RDAP would conduct to um, analyze the question a bit more and, and come back with some recommendations next year. So that's the big picture. Um, the specifics of it I can walk through uh, are pretty straightforward, but uh, I assume that the best approach is to, everyone has the, the document up, the proposal of amendment on a separate screen, so no need to share my screen or, or I can e either way, whatever, whatever your preference is. I don't hear anybody saying they want the screen share, so we'll go without it. <laughs> okay, sounds good. <laughs> sounds like a good approach. Uh, so moving into the language of the proposed amendment then, uh, the report that I just described from RDAP uh, will come back to the House and Senate uh, Judiciary Committees 
And the idea is to report on the creation, as I just mentioned, of a Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics, the purpose of which, as we've also discussed uh, many times, is to collect and analyze data related to systemic racial bias and disparities within the criminal and juvenile justice systems. The report is due on November 15th uh, of this year, 2021. And uh, the, the amendment itemizes several issues uh, that the report needs to address. The first one is the one that uh, I've just been talking about, which is where the Bureau should be situated and where where's the best place to locate the Bureau uh, in terms of government structure. Uh, that so when considering this, uh, the report has to take into account the, you know, the sort of balancing the necessity for independence on the, on the one hand, but on the other hand, there are advantages of having a pre-existing bureaucratic structure, both in terms of administrative support and uh, historical knowledge, that sort of thing. So the report has to weigh the advantages and disadvantages of, of these possibilities of being either a standalone body or being housed in state government. So it gives the, the, uh, ex the uh, interested parties with expertise in this area time to think more, more deeply about these issues and come back with a recommendation later this year. Uh, the report also has to uh, provide some information about uh, staffing. So the Bureau, to how and to what extent the Bureau should be staffed, uh, what should be the scope of the Bureau's mission. In other words, you know, what is its actual uh, purpose and uh, uh, fundamental goals in terms of the data collection. Some specifics uh, also, Subdivision 4, how the Bureau, how the Bureau should collect data uh, and analyze it. And lastly, the best best methods for the Bureau to enforce its data collection and analysis responsibilities. In other words, you know, how do we make sure that the people and entities that are supposed to provide the data comply with the Bureau's uh, mission to collect it, you know, make sure that the, they're able to receive the data uh, that they need to conduct their work. Uh, moving on to the next page, there also there's some specifics about who, who RDAP, and RDAP is the, is the entity uh, working on this report, but there's also other entities with whom they uh, are asked to consult with for purposes of putting this report together. So the legislation requires them to consult with uh, the Vermont Crime Research Group, the National Center on Restorative Justice, UVM, and any other entity that would be of assistance. And it also provides that in addition to consulting with, it, it requires that uh, assistance be provided uh, to RDAP for purposes of this report for from both the Vermont Chief Performance Officer and the Vermont Chief Data Officer. So as, as state employees, it's uh, permissible to require their cooperation as opposed to independent groups. We can just um, require consultation, but you can't necessarily require uh, their, uh, uh, their assistance. So that is the setup as far as other parties with whom the with whom RDAP would consult and get help from as they're putting this report together. Subsection C specifically mandates that the, the report's going to include proposed legislation so that hopefully, obviously, they have something to work with because we've had several iterations of this amendment that the committee's already seen as an RDAP has also already looked at and reviewed. So uh, they won't be starting from scratch. They'll be able to make whatever changes they feel might be necessary. Uh, using the uh, proposed bills that you've looked at already, if that would be helpful. The per diem, which is the reimbursement compensation of RDAP members as they're putting this report together, is what's covered in subsection D. If you look at subsection D, it's got uh, two different pieces. The first sentence is just boilerplate, which I'm sure you've seen many times. This is That's the language that's used uh, whenever we're putting together a summer study committee or an interim uh, work group that's analyzing an issue with a report back. And that just provides that, uh, you know, members who aren't state employees or who, because the idea is that state employees and employees of other organizations who are paid in their professional capacity uh, while they're at the meeting uh, don't need to be sort of uh, getting extra pay for purposes of attending a meeting. But those who aren't, those who aren't either paid as state employees or aren't pay otherwise paid uh, to participate in these summer study groups should be able to get something. And that's what 32 VSA 1010 
the statute referred to in that first sentence provides for. It's a $50 a day per diem uh, for, and the, again, it's for folks who wouldn't otherwise be being being uh, paid or compensated for that day when they attend the meeting. So that's boilerplate language it always appears in these studies, study committees, that first sentence. The second sentence um, is uh, specific to this bill and um, not as uh, perhaps familiar to the committee, but it's, I think, certainly something permissible for the legislature to do, which is to say that, uh, again, the per diem under statute is $50 a day, but uh, that doesn't mean that the legislature can't authorize more than that if they choose to. And that's what the second sentence does and says that uh, uh, you'll see when we get to the next section that there's a $50,000 appropriation to the attorney general's office, which is where RDAP is situated within the attorney general's office. So that $50,000 is uh, intended to uh, pay for this summer study committee and any other associated expenses that they have with that including, as you'll see, contracting uh, with the University of Vermont internship program. So what this sentence says uh, that we're looking at now in subsection D is that of that $50,000 appropriation, the you're providing uh, the attorney general with the discretion to provide more than the $50 per day per diem to any of those folks uh, who are not state employees who do, who are, who do not otherwise uh, receive pay or compensation for uh, attendance at RDAP meetings or participation in the work group, so that if they're not otherwise being compensated, the idea is uh, provide the AG with some discretion to uh, dip into that $50,000 appropriation and pay them more than the $50 a day per diem. So that's what's going on with that second sentence, provides the AG with that discretion to uh, use some of the money in the $50,000 appropriation to pay more than the $50 per day. So if you look at subsection E, that exactly it's exactly what I just mentioned. That is the appropriation. It's uh, for fiscal year 2022. And uh, from the general fund, $50,000 is appropriated to the Office of the AG to complete the work described in this section. So in other words, to develop uh, this report, to research the questions, to work with the other groups identified earlier and make the proposal to the legislature. And it, again, as I mentioned, it specifically provides, this is lines three to seven, that some of that uh, uh, $50,000 can be used to contract with the UVM legislative internship program for purposes of providing support to the panel. So they can get uh, support from the UVM internship program uh, with some of that money, some of that appropriation also. Uh, and the last sentence you see is uh, language that is uh, identical to what's in the RDAP statute when it talks about membership of the RDAP panel. This is just repeating that same language. It's saying interns for the panel uh, shall be drawn from diverse backgrounds to represent the interests of communities of color throughout the state. So that's language that I'm sure is familiar to the committee as well. We use that for uh, to ensure uh, diversity on various state boards and panels. And it's repeated here for purposes of the interns that uh, you've authorized the, the panel to contract with at UVM to provide support. So that's uh, that's the walkthrough, and that's the big picture. It's as I say, it's the uh, essentially from fifty thousand feet. It's the idea that that there's still discussions and attempts to achieve consensus on where the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics are is best placed, and this provides uh, RDAP and other uh, entities whom they consult with with some time to think more about that question and come back to the legislature with a report next fall. Great. Thank you, Eric. Any questions for Eric? Um, Martin? Uh, yeah, this is not so much a question for Eric, but I just one additional piece of information that I think is important for folks to, to understand is a little bit more about who RDAP is. Uh, and we have the witnesses that we have today are all members of RDAP, but there are also several members who are part of the administration. And I think that's important to note because <clears throat> is in support uh, and voted on Tuesday to support uh, this concept, this bill uh, that, that we, we actually went over with RDAP, but it includes uh, representative from the Department of Children and Families, Criminal Justice Training Center. These are folks that are not here today, 
uh, the Vermont State Police, uh, the Department of Corrections, and, and usually the Director of uh, Racial Equity, though not part of RDAP, at least not yet, uh, is also very involved. So I just, I think that's pretty important to understand. And then there are five community <coughs> members as well that are appointed by the uh, Attorney General. So it gives you a concept of who RDAP is. Uh, hopefully that gives some comfort level for folks as far as understand where this came from. So I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thank you. Uh, Bob? Yes, good morning. Good morning, Eric, how you doing? Good, how are you, Representative Norris? Good. I have just, uh, I'm gonna throw a, a two-part question out at you. You probably never saw this one coming, but <laughs> that's being the new guy on the committee here. Mm -hmm. uh, where did the term bureau come from versus department and or office? And do we have any bureaus in the state of Vermont that are not federally uh, assigned? I'm just wondering about the term bureau, that's all. Yeah, uh, to be honest, uh, it was just a matter of, uh, coming up with a, an appropriate, seemed like an appropriate way to describe them. It's not a, a right or wrong, but really where it came up with was I, I came up with it. <laughs> so uh, I based it on the Federal uh, Bureau of Justice Statistics, which I figured since there's a BJS in the, um, in the Department of Justice, uh, that you know, the proposal was to come up with some, some entity, that was the request, I should say, to come up with some entity in Vermont that also dealt with racial or also dealt with justice statistics, specifically racial justice statistics. So um, modeled, it, modeled it on that. So uh, I don't know whether or not the second part of your question, whether whether there's other bureaus and state government in Vermont. Um, but again, as far as the name of it goes, uh, that's certainly the committee felt like a, a better name was a better choice. That's certainly fine. That was just uh, um, needing something that's that sort of encapsulated what the what this entity was doing and basing it on that federal agency. It's not a big sticking point, obviously, but I just associate bureau with something at a federal level versus something uh, directed toward the state of Vermont. That's why it kind of caught my attention. But thank you anyway. Yeah. Well, you were right. That's exactly where it came from. <laughs> um. Yeah, I've got one question, Eric. Uh, well, two in a sense. Um. On the, the chief performance officer and the chief uh, data officer, I don't think we've ever talked about those in this committee or I don't remember talking about them. And I can, uh, I can guess what the chief data officer does. You know, I can probably come pretty close, but what does the chief performance officer do? Uh, actually, the- uh, Oh, chief... coach. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Eric, do you, do you wanna? Do this? No, actually, actually, Representative Christie, I was going to defer to you, so you, you beat me oh. to it, so please do. <laughs> uh, the chief performance officer by name uh, is Susan Zeller, uh, and she is charged uh, from the administration with all of the reports that we get, uh, quality of life reports in Vermont, all of the statistical data uh, that is uh, compiled by the administration. And it's and so for example, when we ask a question about how well is X program doing, her job is to respond to that question with the data that supports that an agency or program and how effective it's been. And that's it. And the, I, I think some of you might remember uh, several years ago when we started utilizing results-based accountability. Mm -hmm. uh, that came out of that office, out of Susan Zeller's office. So you could see where the performance piece sure. you know, aligns. Great, Is that helpful? thank you. Yes, yeah, that's, that was great. Thank you. Um, can I just add to that uh, real quick? Yeah. Um, uh, just real quick, uh, the data, the chief data officer, uh, did help quite a bit on the report that RDAP uh, put out last December uh, regarding the right. bureau and such. Just, just FYI, uh, she has been involved in this uh, yep. at least last year. Great, thank you. And if no more questions for Eric, we will move on to Judge Grierson. Uh, good morning, Chair, Acting Chair. 
Acting chair. Yeah. Acting <laughs> chair. Is that, is that the official title, acting chair? Um, Since it's covered for you, Judge, that's the official title. <laughs> I'm glad someone else answered the question about chief performance officer because, because I did not know the answer either. So thank you, uh, Representative Christie. Uh, for the record, Brian Grierson, uh, Chief Superior Judge. Um, and I guess I'm actually wearing two hats today as the Chief Superior Judge, but also as a member of the RDAP committee. Um, as Representative Lalonde indicated, uh, the witnesses today, um, at least this morning, are members of that committee. And I've been on the RDAP committee since its inception. Um, and I would have to say that, uh, you know, after a kind of a rough start, um, this, this committee has, uh, the panel has really developed into a, a, a cohesive uh, working body. And I think the best evidence of that was the report that was issued um, at the end of, of last year and which really is driving um, this bill and, and the, the recognition of the need to set up, whether it's an agency, a department or bureau, an, an entity, if you will, uh, to gather data that we all know from certainly my time in this role as uh, chief superior judge and testifying before committees, uh, sometimes either the, the lack of, of, of uh, data, um, sometimes the, the, um, the reliability of the data is equally important in the source of it. So I, I um, it, as certainly as a member of the RDAP committee and as I indicated in our meeting the other night when we were reviewing this uh, bill for the first time, I viewed this as a um, really as a, a logical next step in the process that our ADAPT started uh, two years ago. Uh, not only a recognition of the need for data, but what we tried to identify in our most recent report and was reflected in an earlier draft of this bill, uh, the type of data that we, we hope to gather and, and from uh, what entities, but we really need a, a centralized uh, entity to be able to gather this data so that it, the data is useful not only for our DAP, but obviously for the legislature in, in uh, making decisions around uh, legislation. I, I think Representative well, uh, Christie and Lawan um, have done a good job in laying the, the background as to how we arrived at the, this point with this bill. Um, and I would just indicate to the committee and to the chair um, that I support this as a member of the RDAP panel. Um, and as a, as a matter of policy, of course, the judiciary doesn't take a position, but we recognize uh, there is a need to explore uh, where this entity is, is best um, located, whether it's within uh, an agency or whether it's standalone. And I think this bill identifies uh, the issues that we need to uh, work on to, to make that decision. So. Um, that in, in brief is, is my comment on this bill and we, we do support it. Great, thank you, Judge. <clears throat> Any questions for Judge Grierson? It doesn't look like it, Judge. Thank you. All right, thank you. And next we'll hear from uh, Rebecca Turner from the Defender General's office. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Chair Burdett. <laughs> so my name for the record, Rebecca Turner, Appellate Defender, uh, Supervising Attorney for the Office of the Defender General. Also here wearing two hats. Um, I am a member of the panel, the Defender General's designee on that panel. And uh, like Judge Grierson, I have been on that panel since the beginning. And my testimony this morning should be short. Uh, I, we fully support this latest draft uh, bill. It, uh, it reflects um, accurately RDAP's suggestions. RDAP has met two times um, in the past month, uh, actually, and for about four hours to discuss these latest. Um, draft language, and um, it certainly reflects the discussion concerns and recommendations there. So um, we, this is a, a big and important um, 
step, the data collection project. And as Judge Pearson said, this proposal is the natural next step, which gives uh, us more time to go back and dive deeper into the issues uh, that can make and, and provide implementation legislation for next session. Uh, importantly, it provides uh, critical support and resources so that the working group within RDAP can consult with um, the relevant uh, experts in data collection, both within state government and outside, but also most importantly, it can support the community members on the panel to do this important work. Uh, I, uh, I see the uh, deadline of November of this year for this report and appreciate why that deadline is there and appreciate that that is a recognition of trying to get this uh, bill um, front and center for next session. And RDAP understands that. Uh, having worked on similar large projects in a short time frame here, it's about six months, uh, speaking most recently on a judiciary subcommittee, we can uh, probably expect this working group to meet anywhere from two to three to four times a month, um, probably two to three hours at a time. And that is an extraordinary amount of, of time and effort and energy requested of community members who are not otherwise compensated for this work. So I appreciate that this latest draft uh, provides that kind of resources uh, to, to support that as well. I understand too, the, the organizations that are listed there as, as um, experts that we may consult on this project, I understand they, they shared with us that they do not expect to require additional um, fees or, or, or things, but that it may occur. And so this also builds in sort of some allowance that that uh, need may arise. But in any event, in conclusion, uh, I fully support this bill and the Defender General does as well. I also was in communication early this morning with our chair, Dr. Eitan Nasrin Longo, and he cannot be here today, but he uh, authorized me to share with this committee this morning that he also supports this bill because he sees that it accurately reflects the uh, panel's major concerns and recommendations. So thank you. Great, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, any questions? Thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from Evan Meenan from the State's Attorney and Sheriff's Department. Good morning. Uh, my name is Evan Meenan. I am here on behalf of the Vermont Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, and I am also the- I want to welcome you, Evan. I think this is your first time uh, testifying before us. We did meet you a week or so ago, came in to say hello, but, uh, but welcome. <laughs> well, thank you for the warm welcome. Um, I'm also the department's designee on RDAP, and at the last meeting, the group considered a version of this bill that was very similar to the one that the committee is considering this morning. And on behalf of the department, I, uh, I, I voted to support the bill with some changes that were made and, uh, and which now appear in the bill before you. And, and the vote... Uh, from RDAP was unanimous. And so I would expect that the, the group would support the bill that you see. Before the vote, I, I did express some concern or really threw a question out for the group uh, to consider, which was, does the group possess in-house the expertise necessary to answer item number four on line 19 of page one? The feedback that the group provided was that they felt with the assistance of the entities identified on page two, we would be able to have something productive for this committee to consider by the deadline of uh, this coming November. And so with that, um, you know, the, the department shares that optimism. We're hopeful that we will have something productive for everyone to look at and we'll be able to accomplish the assignment that this bill um, asks RDAP to complete. And so unless there's other questions, I think that summarizes the department's position on this bill. Uh, 
Go ahead, Tom. You're doing a great job. <laughs> no, I was I was going to turn it over to you. <laughs> um, yeah. So anyway, Maxine is back, and uh, I will step aside for our chair. Well, thank you. Uh, not not seeing any not seeing any questions. Folks, jump in though if uh, not seeing you. I don't I don't think so. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I believe that um, Lee's David's chair, but I think he's jumping back in, and forth between different uh, committee me meetings. Uh, so I guess I will turn it back to Tom, to you um, and Coach and Martin. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, since, uh, thank you, Maxine. Since David's yeah. gonna be a little late, he's in a, another meeting right now. And when he does, uh, when he does join us, we'll get him here, but um, we'll, we'll get him on to testify. But uh, from here, I, I guess I would ask, uh, like Maxine just mentioned, if if uh, Martin had anything to add or uh, or or coach at this point. Yeah, uh, Martin? yeah I could just jump uh, with kind of process and then coach me uh, explain a little bit why this is really, uh, I think, a critical bill to, to get done. Um, so my my understanding, my hope. Uh, is that um, we will we will take the language that we have in 317 and put it into the miscellaneous judiciary bill. Um, the biggest concern is is getting appropriations the time to look at the fifty thousand dollar appropriation and get that approved. And I'm hoping that by the end of the day, this committee can give the thumbs up on this portion of, uh, you know, on, on this language, putting it into the Judiciary Committee bill so we can also, even before we vote out the Judiciary Committee bill, which I know is on the agenda tomorrow, we can at least give appropriations a heads up that, you know, here's this bill, it's gonna be in the Judiciary Committee bill, it has an appropriation in it, so you can look at it as soon as possible. So that that's the process issue, as I understand. I want to. I'm, I'm seeing. Uh, thankfully, uh, the chair is nodding her head <laughs> that I had that. I think right, uh, but that's the process issue. I, but I, I, I'll turn it back then over to Coach as far as you know the how this is really an important bill. I need to unmute first. <laughs> I'd like to really start again with, um, you know, how this has all come together uh, and the fact that um, when we bought the proposal uh, to RDAP uh, for their original review, and many of you remember historically uh, that there was a wide variety of options as far as placement, you know, of uh, this new entity uh, being the Bureau. Uh, and we all had different opinions as well, even as our committee. So when we got to that version where uh, it, it appeared to make sense that RDAP, you know, was a, a very suitable home, we started to look at how could we make this work effectively within their abilities. And so strengthening you know, that uh, by looking at the membership of the Bureau, uh, having the specialists, uh, having the uh, extended number of data analysts involved, uh, which we saw in the bigger bill originally, uh, were very clear and you could understand why. Uh, and in addition to that, one of the other things that uh, became very clear uh, was housekeeping pieces, for example. Uh, the fact that uh, although the Office of Racial Equity has been participating at all of the RDAP meetings since the office came into existence, it wasn't named as a member. And so that's a housekeeping thing that we can correct uh, before the end of this session, actually, uh, because it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a naming uh, and designating that person back to the RDAP. Um, and 
So that would be one of the, the key housekeeping pieces. And in addition, during the discussion, it became fairly clear that if we added two additional members to our DAP from the community with special skill sets, so we would actually ask our DAP to look to uh, the BIPOC community and disenfranchised community around the state for highly qualified members to be those two people with a background or specialty in data or gathering or analysis. Um, so there's a there's a very uh, hopeful thought thoughtful process in all of these pieces uh, that have come together. Uh, and um, I guess I guess where we're at right now is everybody knows how important uh, data, you know, is to our work, you know, here in judiciary, uh, because in formulating our policy, those questions that we ask about, well, what about this? That is usually in uh, part of that data gathering and analysis. I heard a really great example from one of the experts uh, when we were discussing this. And she called this process of gathering data like a lake. And her metaphor being a data analyst is like a fisher per person noticed I corrected myself really quickly thanks so the fisher person you know would go out and if you wanted a bass you'd use a certain lure you know if you want a northern pike you use a different lure you know so that's the you know a very uh interesting metaphor for uh data gathering uh and and I do that in deference to uh, our colleague Martin because uh, I I promised him I'd stop using as many uh, car metaphors. Uh, so I really enjoyed the data lake <laughs> metaphor. Uh, but in uh, getting to the end of our our discussion, uh, a couple of the other comments that you heard from the witnesses around uh, the equity uh, in selection. Uh, you noticed that there was a specific request uh, in the internship program uh, to ensure that uh, students who normally wouldn't be selected uh, to do these kinds of projects, these summer work projects of support, uh, would would be encouraged with intentionality. Uh, so uh, it's it it affects a lot of pieces of Vermont, and and it's uh, really exciting that we collectively as a committee uh, have this really cool charge that we're working with. So I guess that would would do it for me, Madam Chair, and Vice Chair, and Representative Lalonde. Great. Well. Thank you. I uh, I love all of your metaphors. <laughs> so, <laughs> cars, fish, it's great. Um, so, so it sounds like this language, what you're referring to as housekeeping, would go into um, S97, the miscellaneous judiciary bill is separate language along with along with um, 317, and and that it makes sense because also that's where the elimination of the sunset um, is as well, the RDAP sunset. So, I I do think that that S97 is a good place for this, for this language, um, and as well as taking out this piece and, and sending it to appropriations, um, assuming we approve it as a committee. Uh, I realize I'm coming, coming late to the testimony, but it sounds like there's been quite a bit of agreement from all of our, all of our witnesses. Um, okay, and again, I'll, Tom and Martin, yeah, I, um, I had a question for who can ever answer it, I guess. It, and now, isn't there uh, X amount of dollars in the general fund for things just like this? 
I think every year there's there's so much money set aside for studies in in, in that that type of thing and in, in uh, commissions or panels or whatever bureaus in this case. <laughs> I think that's right. I, I don't know what that amount is and you know right. available, but but I that I've heard that same thing in the past. Uh, uh, right. No, what's going through my mind? It, 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 I'm pretty sure there is, and it just seems like it wouldn't be um, that uh, too long of a discussion, I guess you could say, to um, to do something like this. Hopefully. Yeah, I can I can check with. JFO, I, I do think it's almost like a reserve that after the budget um, is closed, that, that JFO looks to looks at what needs are still outstanding. I think that's correct, but but I'll double check. All right. Thank you. Sure. And I don't see David here yet, uh, Madam Chair. So right. Uh, let's see. Should we? Up oh, here he is. Actually, great. <laughs> oh, timing is everything. Yeah, right. Yeah. Speaking, it shall be. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Happening all the yeah, time. Yeah, really. <laughs> okay. Um, welcome, David. Uh, we're just. We've been waiting a, a little bit for you, and I are you are you ready? I want to give you time to catch your breath, or but you're but you're up when you when you are. Okay, I can go. Sorry, I'm late. The meeting, okay. I couldn't leave. Um, yeah, no worries. But Welcome. yes, thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'm I'm sorry I haven't been able to listen to the discussion so far this morning. But certainly, the office supports the the bill or. The amended bill, um, as it's been presented this morning, and I'm looking at draft 6.1 here. Um, and you know, it's been our practice to largely be deferential to panel decisions. We're one member of that panel, and um, want to respect their process. That being said, I think that this does reflect that process, and I think it's uh, an important step forward. And we'd certainly support it, and we are happy also to. Um, be supportive in the administrative sense with respect to fund disbursements that uh, may be necessary um, uh, to, to have a high quality work product. So uh, we are supportive of it. And um, I was the only thing that this is a, oh, I was just thinking about like our, when our technical amount substantive, when our finance folks are looking at it, I just want to make sure that they have adequate direction. And so this just occurred to me as I was looking at the draft in subdivision. It may be useful to just have a sentence in there. And if others disagree with me on this, I will defer. It may be useful to have a sentence in there just saying the funds can be used for not, not only for the per diems in the internship program, which are explicitly provided for, but could also be used for um, uh, contracting with experts or some some phrase like that just to make it very clear because I think that's the intention and mm -hmm. I just want the intention to be um, stated plainly so we don't run into any issues down the road when our folks are our, our finance folks are trying to make sure they're acting within the provisions uh, madam chair uh, actually at the RDAP meeting uh, that was a comment and uh, we can uh, defer to uh, our three witnesses to concur that that's what I had actually heard too. Uh, so putting that uh, uh, that caveat in there is is important. Thank you. Yes, I was going to give give the witnesses an opportunity when when David is finished to to weigh in on on the addition of that of that language. Thank you, Coach. And that, that, that's, my, that's all I have to say. We're supportive. We appreciate the work that's been done on it and happy to support the panel in, in this work and happy to take questions. And um, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Uh, Tom. Yeah, I'm just wondering on, on uh, let's see, page two, line seven, D, uh, 
um, it, it lists people to consult with and it says any other entity that would be of assistance to the Bureau, is that covered there or does it need to be covered uh, uh, stating that there could be an expenditure, I guess? My concern is really about stating explicitly uh, what the money can be used for, not just who it could be used for. So um, yeah, I would, I, just out of an abundance of caution, but if others who are more expert in the, in the use of funds disagree with me, I'll defer to that, but I just don't wanna run it down the road where it was like, clearly we meant for this to be used to uh, allow for contracting and that, but it wasn't in there. So, you know, I don't wanna run into that situation. Sure, thank you. Certainly. Appreciate that. Uh, Martin. Yeah, I guess I'm just wondering. Um, yeah, we, we could certainly put some language in, but uh, you know, we're, we're on a tight time frame. Uh, I'm just wondering why on uh, page three, line two, uh, where it's talking about the funds uh, to complete the work described in the section uh, as you know, if it connects up to you know, the con consultation component if that is, is sufficient. I think that that's fairly broad. I mean, it's, it's whatever is necessary. And that was the, the concept. And, and, and I don't know that I, I mean, we needed to put in the, the bit about the legislative internship program because that's a little bit different, but I didn't want to start having like a list of what those items might be, you know, uh, because then it starts, when you have a list, <laughs> The, the concern is, well, if something's not on that list, is it excluded? You know, what, what if they need some copying services or just basic stuff like that? So I'm just really curious if, if it's just sufficient to, to, to have that broad language. I certainly take your point about the tight timeline. And yes, I think that it can and should be interpreted that way. And I'm certainly, and we are establishing right now a record <laughs> that it should be interpreted uh, that way, which frankly, will be helpful down the road if there is any dispute about that. And I'm willing to go to bat, so to speak, for that interpretation inside the office. So um, it, I, I think that can be read to be sufficient. And uh, if that is necessary, we'll, we'll, we'll work with that and, and uh, make sure that there aren't issues down the road. No, I, I appreciate that because, uh, well, I'm sorry, Maxine, you're just going to yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, and I guess I would turn to Eric in terms of drafting, um, getting a new draft of this language with the, um, with the language that the Attorney General's office um, needs. How, Eric, how is that doable for you? And, and if so, when? Um, so uh, I think it, it's doable. I, I don't see, I, I agree with Representative Lalonde, I, I don't see that there's a need for it, but uh, um, I think it's pretty clear. But I suppose you could say um, uh, in line three, instead of a portion, you could say portions of which may be used uh, to contract with entities for support and to contract with the University of Vermont legislative internship program if you felt like you wanted to be have an abundance of caution. Thank you. David, does that, does that address your concerns? That would, yes. Um, and I think that the, the uh, open language, open-ended language in um, line two in particular about completing the work sort of covers administrative costs clearly. Um, so that, that would be great. But again, if there is a, a timing issue here, we'll, we'll work with what we have. Okay, thank you. Uh, Martin, did you? Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, I think that that's fine. I mean, if, if that could be put in and turned around, because I was actually hoping to even make a motion uh, for a straw poll that we approve this so we can get it in front of appropriations. But I suppose we could do that uh, first thing after the break, maybe. If that, if that works with you, Eric. Yeah, and that's fine. Yep. I mean, if that, if that, if that works, uh, Chair, you know, because, because I was planning on making the motion just so we can move it on to appropriations so they can start looking at it. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think if we could wait the what fifteen minutes or so, that's probably better. So everybody has the language in front of them and knows knows exactly what they're what they're um, voting on. And I certainly 
we'll extend an opportunity to our other witnesses to um, to chime in on on this issue if if they want. Uh, but if if not, then I'll take that as there isn't any opposition. Just give folks a Evan. Uh, Evan Mead and on behalf of the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, just, just for the record, I, I interpreted this bill as allowing the Attorney General's Office to use that money not only for the internship program and to supplement the per diem, but to also really spend it for any purpose that was encapsulated uh, in the bill. But we have no objection whatsoever to making that more explicit. So that's fine with us. Thank you. Appreciate that. Anybody else? Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, thank you, uh, Rebecca Turner. Uh, I also wanted to confirm that that would, all, would not be a problem. I read the language similarly, but clarification is fine. It certainly is the intent or was the expressed intent during the discussions over the past two weeks with RDAP that the money or the funding not be just dedicated to per diem but to any other costs to support the effort. Thanks. So, so thank, I, thank you. Go, go ahead, Martin. Yeah, I'll just wait. You know, the more I think of it in the last 30 seconds, uh, I think it's actually probably smart to put it in there because that will help uh, appropriations understand what we have that money in there for. So so I think that, that it, 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 we may not need it here, but I think it will help uh, smooth the path in, in appropriations. Thank you. And, and Madam Chair, I would agree. Um, the more clarity uh, for our colleagues uh, upstairs, the virtually, no, they're virtually upstairs uh, is important. Okay, good, thank you. All right, so I'm not seeing any, any other hands or any, uh, uh, Bob, is that, are you, is that your hand up or are you, are you waving goodbye? <laughs> oh, thank you. That is my hand up. I'm okay. not. Okay. Uh, a quick question as the new person here, uh, the poor representative of the lawn pushes this straw vote through and whatever else. I guess you're going to have to explain to me exactly what we're voting on and, and what's happening with this amendment so that I know. I don't, I don't know if the time or after the break or whatever. Maxine, whatever. Well, how about if you do it now, so that way during the break, folks can can think about it and and see if any questions come up. Um, if you could explain, not not make the motion, but but just ex sure, explain sure. where you're where you're going, please. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, as I think we've already done, I don't know if we've taken straw polls, but we've taken different parts. Uh, you know, the divisible parts, I guess I could call it, uh, separate independent parts that we're going to put into the, uh, this miscellaneous judiciary bill. Uh, for instance, we, we had recommendations on, I believe it was a juvenile justice uh, issue from the court, and we heard kind of separately about that. I don't know if at the end of the day we took a, a straw poll on that part or not, but it's kind of similar. You know, this is a separate part that we want to put into this miscellaneous bill. Uh, and, and that's actually why we hold the miscellaneous bill towards as long as possible, because we have things that kind of come up uh, along the way. The other, the other part that, uh, which is separate than 317, uh, is, is ensuring that the Office of uh, the Director of Racial Equity is part of our DAP. That's something that came very late that we really only learned in the past week that we can put in. But we like to, I think, with those separate parts, uh, make sure that we're trying to reach uh, compromise, you know, reach, reach a, a point where everybody's on board because usually the miscellaneous judiciary bill doesn't have controversial bits in it. I mean, that at, at least in my history here. Uh, so it's really trying to make sure everybody's on board. Is everybody comfortable with this part before we put it into our, our, our larger bill, which, which has several components. Did, did, that, did I cover it? Uh, or did you have more to add, Maxine? You did cover it. Uh, Bob, was that, does that help? It helps to a certain extent. I, I guess I have two, two quick follow-up questions here. And I apologize for not being familiar with the, with the whole system here. Uh, maybe if you could just briefly explain to me what the miscellaneous judiciary bill is. 
And are we looking at this amendment and so on and so forth? Are we looking at pushing this into a summer study from what I can assume to come back uh, on or about November to have another report for uh, this, this committee or what, what direction are we heading in here? So, so I think it's, it's a, a little more, uh, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll defer to the chair on, on just the findings as generally the miscellaneous judiciary bill. But as far as what we're trying to accomplish with this is it's this next step, uh, as I explained earlier in this long path that we've been taking to get to the point of really gathering uh, this criminal justice data. Uh, and and the, I think a key component of this is in, in the bill, it's on page two, line 11 and 12, is we're asking for draft legislation. So it's not just like a study that, you know, here's kind of what we think. We want to know how to implement uh, what we put in the earlier version of this 317 that, that the committee has looked at uh, previously uh, for, for the, this bureau, whatever we end up calling the entity. Uh, but, but this is, all right, well, we've really found that there's not agreement as Eric was saying, uh, as far as how to exactly put this into place, where it should go, et cetera. And we want these folks who have been dealing with this for the last three years uh, to take this next step, help us take this next step and, and give us the draft legislation uh, that, that we will then turn into our, uh, to a bill. Uh, and hopefully, you know, next year, hopefully we'll make, uh, we'll make the next step on this as well. I don't know if, if that was helpful or not. I think it's better. So what I'm hearing is, is there's going to be further discussion uh, and length on 317 and, and next year, good Lord willing, the creek don't rise, we're all going to come back and we're going to sit down and, and go through this uh, a little more thoroughly, shall we say? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we will do our full due diligence next year and see if we agree with whatever uh, these folks come up with. But it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty good organization to be considering it because it has all of the folks that we would want to weigh in. Uh, and they are a pretty well-functioning group. I will add also that it's a public, uh, they have public meetings. And, and if you want to, or anybody wants to keep track of what's going on, they can get on the distribution list as far as uh, an invitation to go to that. I've been going to them and I probably intend to continue to go to them to hear what's happening and, and, and Representative Christie has as well. Uh, so just so you know, I mean, there, there is that work that's going on, but it's being done in public over the, over the off session. Uh, and, and people who are interested can, can certainly follow what their work is. But having said that, it, it's, you know, the, the bill hits, you know, first of all, they're not introducing the bill. Whatever draft legislation comes, it will go to uh, the Judiciary Committee here and in the Senate. And somebody will have to take that and ask for, a, you know, make a bill request. Uh, to have that. And, and then there's also going to be the decision of whether the Senate takes it up first or if we take it up first uh, next year. So those things are down the road issues, but we want to get these experts together uh, to tell us what is the best way to implement this and give us draft language to, to do it. Great. I, I appreciate that. And Maxine, thank you, because I, I do have, uh, I will have uh, some questions and thoughts on this. I'll Absolutely, and do you want me to explain the miscellaneous judiciary bill? What they, what, what it, what that concept is, or, or are you, are you good? very helpful to me, anyways? Yes. Okay, right. No, um, absolutely. So every every year there is um, a miscellaneous judiciary bill. We used to call it the technical um, judiciary bill, but there's a little bit of substance in it sometimes. But um, what it is really is, it is a a placeholder, um, sort of a compilation of, of often unrelated uh, pieces of, of um, legislation um, that address issues that have come up um, maybe in the summer, in the fall, that are not so technical that legislative council can, can fix them or, or something like that, where they really do need a legislative fix. And, um, and each year it's different. And uh, so the fixes could come from the judiciary, from other parts of, of state government, the administration. And as, um, as Martin said, we hold it until the, um, until the end in case, in case something does come up that 
didn't make it into another bill, let's say, or we, um, you know, in this case, 317 um, did not make crossover. Um, so it, so the Senate really couldn't take it up. So by putting it in the miscellaneous judiciary bill, the Senate can consider it. Um, in terms of the miscellaneous judiciary bill, I'm in, in touch with, um, with my counterpart in the, in the Senate, Senator Sears, as to what is going in there. Um, maybe there's something that, that the Senate would like us to put in on our side. So it's, it's really an ongoing conversation of addressing, of addressing generally um, uncontroversial um, needs as, as they come up. And um, usually it's, it's uh, one bo body starts it and then the other continues. Um, in this case, it was the Senate. Does that, does that, does that help? It does help, thank you. Uh, yeah. I, I don't have the, uh, the time, obviously, and I'm striving to uh, learn as I go here, and I don't know if a lot of you have forgotten that <laughs> as this new, new folks come in here, but I appreciate uh, both yours and the representative of the lawn's uh, explanation, thank you. Yeah, no, no, thank you, and please keep, keep asking those questions, and uh, Eric, I see your hand up. Yeah, I just, uh, thank you, Representative Brad. The only thing I would wanna add that I think is also useful to know is that many other committees have miscellaneous bills every year. So it's not, a, not an unusual thing for, for the judiciary miscellaneous bill. There's a miscellaneous tax bill every year. There's a miscellaneous education bill, miscellaneous motor vehicles bill. So to deal with the, exactly what you just mentioned, all those smaller issues that come up or technical things that our office or others discover. So it's just a, helps to know that that's a common practice throughout all the committees. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, that's a really important point. Thank you. I, I you appreciate bet. that. And and we will, I think, I forget if it's this afternoon or tomorrow, We um, Eric will do a, a walkthrough of, of the entire bill because we, like, you know, we, we keep on putting little parts into it, but it's been a while that we've actually looked at everything at, at, at the same time. So. Thank you for your patience. No, I, absolutely no, thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, great. So let's come back at, why don't we come back at 1030 uh, and we'll take this up.